G'day cobbers, welcome back to the bush. In this episode of Lockout's Four Wheel Driving, we're going to check out lead acid versus lithium ion phosphate batteries for your four wheel drive. How they work, how they charge, how they discharge, and what's more cost effective in the long run. So, let's get into it. First up, what's inside one of these lead acid batteries? So you'd all be familiar with what the outside of a lead acid battery looks like with this hard plastic case and our positive terminal and our negative terminal. What about the inside though? Well, we've got six identical, and what these are called are cells. And each cell comprises of a lead anode, a separator plate, which is non-conductive, and a lead dioxide cathode. Now, each cell produces nominally around about 2.1 volts. And if you add them up in series, all you do is add the voltages together. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And that gives you a total voltage of around about 12.6 volts. Now, these types of batteries are called flooded lead acid for a reason. And that's because they're swimming in electrolyte. In this case, it's sulfuric acid and water. Now, that's all fine and well, but how does this chemical process actually work? Let's have a look at that now. This diagram is just one of the six cells in a lead acid battery. And we'll show you how it creates electrical energy from chemical energy able to power a load. On the left hand side you can see the positive cathode made of lead dioxide and on the right hand side there's a negative anode made of pure lead. There's a separator plate in the middle made of polymer plastic and the whole thing, the whole shebang, is swimming in a sea of electrolyte made of one third sulfuric acid two thirds water. The positive cathode of lead dioxide reacts with the sulfate in the electrolyte this then forms an outer coating of lead sulfate on that positive cathode. When this happens, an oxygen ion is spat out from that positive cathode and it joins the two hydrogen ions creating H2O or water. Of course, this will dilute the strength of the sulfuric acid electrolyte. Simultaneously, the sulfate in the electrolyte will head on over to that negative lead anode just as before creating a layer of lead sulfate on the negative anode when this happens two electrons are released now we have a potential difference between our negative and positive terminals and we're able to power our load so thankfully the chemical process of discharging a lead acid cell is completely reversible by charging it up now when we turn on the charger now it doesn't really matter whether it's an alternator or a solar cell, the process is just the same. What it does is it creates a flow of electrons back into that negative anode. Now that then in turn releases the sulfate ions back into the electrolyte, leaving just lead on the plate. These sulfate ions combine back with those hydrogen ions, releasing the oxygen ions, increasing the strength of the sulfuric acid electrolyte. Basically, it turns water back into sulfuric acid. Now, these free oxygen atoms head on over to this lead sulfate in the positive cathode to recreate lead dioxide. This then releases the sulfate ion back into the electrolyte that recombines with the two hydrogen ions down here to further increase the strength of the electrolyte. Now this process will continue until all of the lead sulfate on the positive cathode is converted back to lead dioxide and only then is the battery fully charged. Now we know how old reliable the lead acid works, what about lithium ion phosphate? New kit on the block, let's check that out. Now for the creme de la creme, the piece de resistance. That's right, the lithium ion phosphate battery. This is the one that all the 200 hubbies pine after. Now, on the outside, of course, we have our positive and negative terminals. No surprises there. But where it gets different from a lead acid cell is the copper anode and the aluminium cathode. Now, where's this lithium iron phosphate? Well, there's a paste up against the copper anode, and that comprises of lithium, iron, and phosphate. So, hence the name, lithium iron phosphate battery. On the negative side, you'll be able to see a carbon lattice made of graphite. And of course, we have an electrolyte to transfer the lithium from one side to the other as it charges and discharges. But we'll get into that in a second. Now, this type of battery is often referred to as a rocking chair battery, and you'll understand why in a second. Finally, we have a separator or a permeable membrane to stop 
the positive from shorting out on the negative and battery go boom. Okay, let's have a look how we're going to discharge this battery. So now let's check out exactly how a lithium iron phosphate battery discharges or actually powers something. Now in a fully charged lithium iron phosphate battery, your carbon lattice here, that'll be comprised of most of your lithium ions in a fully charged lithium iron phosphate battery. Now when you start drawing a load, it'll pull electrons out of that aluminium negative cathode into your load to use it, whether that be powering your lights, your travel buddy, or maybe even a dirty great big inverter running an induction cooktop. I'm looking at you, Steve. <laughs> what happens is the iron phosphate matrix on this side actually draws those lithium ions back into that matrix. And it will keep drawing those ions back into that matrix, those lithium ions, until it completely depletes the lithium ions out of this carbon matrix. And then your battery is completely flat. But what about loading it up again? When you draw out that big heap of current running your induction cooktop for your three kilowatt inverter, <laughs> you've got to put that energy back in. Let's have a look at that now. So now let's check out how a lithium iron phosphate battery actually charges up. Let's say we've considerably depleted it. We've put our air fry in the back of our 200 run through our one and a half kilowatt King's inverter, <laughs> cooking up some Palmers, like everyone does out in the bush, I believe. Rightio, so we turn on our engine and we start generating those electrons back into the negative side of our battery, back through our aluminium cathode. And what that does when we're charging is it draws those lithium ions back through that semi-permeable membrane back into the carbon lattice. It takes it out of our iron phosphate lattice and back into our carbon lattice. Again, until it's fully charged, when it completely depletes the lithium ions in the iron phosphate lattice and they're all in the carbon lattice, well, your battery's back and fully charged. And on to the next Palmer. That's how a lithium iron phosphate battery charges up. So while it's great to understand how they work, what about the all important performance? Firstly, specific energy, and that's how much energy they have per kilogram of weight in the different battery chemistries. Let's check it out. Now let's check out the results. We got zero to 140 watt hours per kilogram. Now lead acid comes in at 37.5 watt hours per kilogram, whereas lithium iron phosphate, 125 watt hours per kilogram, and that, is a 233% improvement. There's basically no comparison between the two. 233%, well, that's a great improvement. So this round to the lithium iron phosphate, but what about energy density? Energy density is the amount of energy per given volume. So let's say per litre, let's check it out. So we've got zero to 350 watt hours per litre of volume. Lead acid rolls in at 85 watt hours per litre, Whereas lithium iron phosphate, 325 watt hours per litre. That's a 282% improvement. It's not even within the ballpark range. It's not even the same sport. <laughs> Massive improvements there. 282% improvement. This win by knockout blow definitely goes to the lithium iron phosphate. But what about specific power? That's basically power to weight ratio. Let's check it out. Now, specific power is measured in watts per kilogram. And notice here we've gone from 70 to 200 instead of running from zero. Now, lead acid come in at 180 watts per kilogram and lithium iron phosphate, 200 watts per kilogram. So it's an 11% improvement. It's not a massive improvement, but it is better. Yet another win to the lithium iron phosphate battery. Well, this one's not a knockout blow, but it definitely got through on points. Next one, cycle count, round four. How many charge and discharge cycles can you reasonably expect lead acid versus lithium iron phosphate? Let's have a look. Now let's have a look at number of cycles. Now there can be a number of variables which will affect the cycle life of a battery, including the quality of manufacturer, uh, the depth of discharge, the environmental conditions, lots of different variables. But on average, lead acid is around about a thousand cycles. Whereas they quoted for the cells that I purchased, 6,000 cycles. Now, I'm not sure if I'll get right to there. They might outsee me, but it's not unusual to get twice the number of cycles or at least 10 years out of a lithium iron phosphate cell. So that's a 500% improvement. I'm not complaining there either. 
Now you'll pay extra for lithium ion phosphate, so it's great to know not only are the performance characteristics better, but it's gonna last longer as well. Now you might've heard that lithium ion phosphate has better voltage characteristics than your old lead acid. And that's got to do with the voltage discharge curve. Let's have a look at that in a bit more detail. So one of the biggest advantages of a lithium ion phosphate battery in comparison with a lead acid battery is what's called voltage discharge curve. Let's explain what I mean. So this is the discharge curve of a lithium ion phosphate battery. Now you can see in between about 80% state of charge or maybe even 90 and about 40% there, it remains pretty flat. Let's have a look at a lead acid. The lead acid, as you can see, drops off considerably at a 50% state of charge. We're considerably ahead in voltage with the lithium iron phosphate. But what does that matter anyway? Well, let's say we're running something like a travel buddy. And to be fair, we'll put a 50% state of charge on the lead acid and the same state of charge on the lithium iron. So we've got 11.5 volts coming out of our lead acid battery and we've got 12.6 volts coming out of a lithium iron. So that's 121 watts on the lithium iron being generated in heat in your travel buddy to cook your pies and that's all very important. <laughs> and only 101 watts in your travel buddy at the same state of charge of battery just because the voltage is different. And that is a 20% improvement. It's exactly the same state of charge. Obviously, if you really want to fix up a travel buddy's performance, well, you get one of these suckers a step up. Now, if you haven't seen what a step up can do for the performance of your travel buddy or other 12 volt oven, I'll link up above. They're absolutely fantastic. Anyway, on with the program. Now we know that the lithium ion phosphate chemistry is a big advantage as far as voltage is concerned in comparison with your lead acid. Next up, depth of discharge, otherwise known as, well, I've paid for all this energy. How much can I actually use of it? So let's have a look at depth of discharge. Lithium ion phosphate versus lead acid. Firstly, what is depth of discharge? Well, it's the percentage of your rated capacity that you can go down to without hurting the chemistry in the battery. So with the lead acid, you can go down to a 50% depth of discharge from the top down to there, or a 50% state of charge from the bottom up to here without hurting the battery. So if it's a 100 amp hour battery, you get 50 amp hours of usage. Let's compare that with the lithium ion phosphate. Lithium ion phosphate will go down to 20% state of charge from the bottom to there. So down 80% depth of discharge regularly without hurting the battery. Now lithium ion phosphate can actually go down to 100% depth of discharge or 0% state of charge when you're checking the capacity of the battery and won't really hurt it. But they say for maximum life in the battery, stick to 20%. That's a fantastic difference. On a 100 amp hour battery, you get an extra 30 amp hours. Unbelievable. So another convincing round on points to the lithium ion phosphate. But you would have noticed the initial cost, the buy-in cost of lithium ion phosphate is a lot more than any of the lead acid technology. But what about overall cost over the duration that you're gonna own the battery? Let's check that out now. So now let's have a look at a cost analysis using the factory specs between a lead acid battery versus a commercially available lithium battery versus your DIY lithium iron phosphate build. Now, I've chosen the unit of cents per amp hour per cycle. So it takes into consideration the initial cost, the rated amp hour capacity, and how long it's gonna last. Now, the lead acid I've chosen is the Full River 105 amp hour AGM battery. And they seem to run about $400. I've had a couple of these over the journey. They're decent quality batteries. That works out to be 0.8 cents per amp hour per cycle. Pretty good. Okay, now your DCS 100 amp hour, they're yeah, a bit more expensive at $1,400 for a 100 amp hour battery. And that works out to 0.56 per cents per amp hour per cycle. And that is a 30% improvement. That doesn't even take into consideration the depth of discharge. So you're doing considerably better, obviously, with the lithium chemistry than you are with lead acid chemistry. Finally, your lithium iron phosphate DIY build works out to be 0.06 cents per amp hour per cycle with a total cost including the BMS and the cells of about a thousand dollars landed here in Australia and that is a whopping 93% improvement over a lead acid cell. I don't think I'll be buying any more of those full river batteries. I think it's lithium from here on in. While the commercial lithium 
with its initial higher buy-in price. Looked like a great deal overall in comparison with lead acid. Neither could hold a bar to your DIY lithium iron solution. Now in the next episode, we'll be starting construction of your DIY lithium iron battery. And that means balancing. Top balancing versus bottom balancing. And do you even need to balance in the first place? So make sure you subscribe for that one. Now if you like this video guys, give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't, by all means, give it a thumbs down. Not once, not thrice, but twice. Thanks guys, I'm getting out of this rain. I'll see you in the next one. So if you've enjoyed this content, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell icon. It's really important to us and you won't miss out on our future content. Now, if you want to support the channel, by all means, consider becoming a patron on Patreon and you'll get things like early access to our videos on YouTube. Either way, we hope to see you out on the tracks.